Welcome to Behind the Line, the podcast where you'll get untold stories from first responders and military veterans. I'm Tim Hegman. I'll be your host. My guest today is retired police chief Keith Kaufman. Keith began his law enforcement career in 1994 with the Hawthorne Police Department located in Southern California. In 2015, Keith was appointed as the police chief of the Redondo Beach Police Department, also located in Southern California. In February of 2022, after 28 years in law enforcement, Keith decided it was time to turn the page and retire. But he stayed on as the city's acting fire chief until August of 2022. Keith worked a number of assignments while a police officer. He's a two-time recipient of the Medal of Valor. He and several other officers are responsible for the successful community program, Coffee with the Cop, which is now being used in all 50 states. In 2014, he authored and published an article called The System is Broken, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And in 2022, he, along with a retired chief deputy of the Los Angeles Fire Department, conducted extensive research and prepared an article titled An Assessment of the Redondo Beach Fire Department. Please join me in welcoming retired chief Keith Kaufman. Keith, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate you taking the time to spend with us on the Behind the Line podcast. This is exactly how I pictured my retirement going, <laughs> doing podcasts. And yeah. Yeah. Is, thank you. I'm actually excited to be here. It's cool. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time to be here, especially during this week of Thanksgiving. Absolutely. Thank you. So let's off, start off with one of the most important questions. How's retirement? This is the best thing ever. Yeah. I, it's better than I imagined. Every day is Saturday. There's no problem with what a lot of people have told me would there would be a problem with which is hey you're not going to know what to do like you're going to go back to work right away and I don't have an issue with that <laughs> I've had <laughs> I've always had a lot of hobbies and lots of other interests besides law enforcement I don't I actually don't think being a cop ever really defined me like as a person so I'm able to explore all those other things now and I love it it's awesome yeah it's highly recommended that's right yeah for sure so with that do you find yourself now that you're retired busier than when you were working full-time it seems like it but I'm definitely busier on it's obviously different things like, yeah I'm not busier checking the phone waiting for the next travesty to happen I'm, I'm busier like wow hey can I pick up and leave tomorrow and drive to Paso and go see some friends or yeah. like just busy with stuff yeah but I also realize hey I need to keep my I need to keep my mind fresh and active so I'm like figuring out things to do that's turning me into the person that was in charge of a lot of stuff to just going back to being like a student. Yeah. So I think that's what I'm enjoying right now. Yeah. It's a good, good adventure to, to do different things and to catch up on those things you are unable to do when you're working. But with that, what are some of the things, what are your hobbies? What are you doing to keep busy? So I try to surf as much as I can. I spearfish a lot. Oh. And that was one of the things that started to go by the wayside when I became a chief and then really got into LA County Chiefs and that whole thing. When time was limited, that was probably one of my hobbies that slipped the most. So spearfishing is a huge passion of mine. It's pray for waves and <laughs> surf. And then when it's flat, pray for fish and spearfish. But I picked up flying. So I am okay. now a student pilot flying a Cessna, a little 180 bush plane. And that's a challenge. And I don't know if it's as challenging as golf though. So <laughs> I'm playing golf too. Yeah. I play golf not very well. <laughs> and if I was going to attempt to fly based on my golf skills, I would be grounded all the time. Yeah. Not yeah. good at all. Yeah. Both are, uh, both are challenging and humbling adventures for sure. Very much. And even uh, for me, even on my worst round of golf, it's still a great day to be out there on a beautiful course with your buddies enjoying the day. Yeah. Flying's the same way. Like yeah. Six bad landings and then all of a sudden you do one and it's beautiful and you're like, okay, I'm back. Yeah. I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. relate to that. It sucks you in. Yes. As a police officer, what were some of the assignments that you did? What were what, you, what were you involved in? A little bit of everything. I think most people that end up like in a 28 year career, they get to span all the different things that, that are available in law enforcement. That was me, except for the fact that I probably missed out on a lot of those because I started promoting early. Got you it. know, once you promote to sergeant, your your sphere of things to do starts to become smaller. Sure. However, what I always tell people that have great leadership characteristics that are thinking about promoting is you may not be able to do that directly, but you might be able to do that from from the position of leadership and maybe make that area of the organization grow so for me 
started off as the, the basic beat cop. And at some point I was on the SWAT team and I did that for 10 years and I got to work an undercover part of the department for a while that was in Hawthorne. I did that about a year and a half. I was a training officer and those were most of the specialized assignments I had. And then I started moving into detectives and then, or I'm sorry, not detectives, but became a sergeant. And one of the first assignments I have, they're like, you're going to run the traffic bureau. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how to ride a ticket and I hate motorcycles at the time. Wow. I was like, this is not for me. I remember telling the captain, I'm like, yeah, you totally have the wrong person. I want to go out and work dope yeah. and do all this other stuff. And they're like, no, you're doing it. Yeah. And luckily I had good leadership that was like, no, you need to see this part of it because we all know that have ever worked traffic. You want to see a different part of the community. Oh yeah. You start working traffic. I don't care where you're at how violent the crime is. That's yeah. like the number one problem. And people get really passionate about it. It's the guy going 60 miles an hour down the street running the stop sign. Oh yeah. So I did that and it's just weird how everything comes for full circle. I remember working that and I remember telling the guys that worked for me, I'm like, this is stupid. You ride these motorcycles and these, these outfits that look like 1800s cavalry. <laughs> That's right, yeah. What are those boots about? This is dumb. And so way back when, I had a guy that was interested and we put a full fu full face helmet on him. And oh my God, the ridicule, <laughs> it, was, it was insane. Oh yeah. As I was able to promote and move away from working in those specialized units, but focus more on leadership and supervision and stuff. And now it's, hey, put up or shut up. So when I'm a chief of police and I'm running a traffic bureau, it's either do something about it or stop complaining. And I think right. that's where I really found my passion in law enforcement was trying to work on being a change agent in certain aspects. That's what interest, interest, interested me a lot. Yeah. yeah. I think what you touched on, a lot of times, anybody can do this, but say in a supervisory role as a sergeant, lieutenant, whatever it is, I think there's a lot of times there's, say, officers that you may see something in, the, in, in that person that they're not aware of, and you encourage them to take a role, traffic, or whatever it is, and they, they may be reluctant or resistant, and sometimes people don't know they're, what they're capable of doing, but other people see it. And I think a good supervisor will then see it and not only just say, okay, but to actually give them an opportunity to work it. And I think most times people realize, oh, I had no idea I, I would like to do this. Yeah, it's very true. You need to listen to, especially the good mentors and stuff yeah. that we have in life, because their wisdom, if you fail to accept some of those opportunities or challenge yourself with some of the directions that are being presented to you, you could really miss out. Oh yeah. Shoot. I almost missed out on being a police chief. Best job I ever had. Yeah. Best job of any of the jobs in law enforcement I ever had was being a police chief. It was the, the most fun. I yeah. loved it. Um, I could have easily missed out on that. And luckily had some great mentors and, yep. and they kicked me in the butt a little bit and they're like, look, man, you, you need to do this. What are you doing? You're always talking to people about, oh, take this opportunity and grow and all this kind of shit. And then you're not going to do it. And that was ultimately the thing. I was like, Ooh, wow, yeah. that's a good mentor right there. So yeah. I, I better put up or shut up. And, yeah. and, but you're right. You can easily get pigeonholed into different aspects of any job for sure. Uh, and law enforcement for sure. Civil services is, is tough to navigate, right? It has its own system and politics and very much, so. especially in smaller departments. Like we both worked, there's nowhere to hide. No, there's nowhere to hide. So you can make a mistake and kind of live with that jacket for your entire career. Yeah, it's very difficult to shed a jacket if you have it, even though you've tried to, whatever the reason. But yeah, in a small department, a lot of times you do get pigeonholed, or people do, and it's unfortunate. But I think as a good supervisor, mentor will recognize what people are capable of doing and then give them an opportunity to work it. Hell yeah. yeah. Okay, so you became a police officer in 94 with the Hawthorne Police Department. You retired with the Redondo Beach Police Department as a chief in 2022. In those 28 years, what do you think was one of the, the, maybe not just one, but a major change in policing? So for me, it definitely had to do with shifting a f my own personal philosophy about policing and what it was about. And that would be the transition from running and gunning and, okay, this is, this is really all about putting the bad man in jail to, wait a minute, this is maybe more about being a, a partner 
in the community. Right. Like you, you start, see, I started to see law enforcement as a smaller piece of, of a bigger puzzle where all of those things function together. And co the coffee with a cop thing for me, God, it sounds like the most ridiculous thing ever, <laughs> but it probably had the biggest impact on my career, my policing philosophy, because I saw true change actually taking a hold of entire departments and no one will ever be able to tell me, no, that doesn't work or law enforcement can't change or this and that. No, it's not true. I had definitely seen major leaps and bounds in the relationships that, that agencies were having with their community. Yeah, I agree. And I was, we worked together back then when you told our group of the commanders and whatever, what oh this was God. about and the grant you were given and whatnot. And we were like, oh, what is this all about? But then everybody's doing it. And I know our agency, we went head first and very involved. And I do agree that it really has bridged the gap or really helped with the communication with the law enforcement and the public and having that one-on-one -on -one I think yeah, it's great. Obviously, it's a success. It works because it's like, it's not just a, it is a program, but it's more of a policing philosophy that is exemplified through this program of coffee with a cop because coffee is really that vehicle that breaks the barrier for the conversation. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be coffee. It can be the Africa twin motorcycle that people look at and go, hey, what the hell is that? I want to talk to you about that. Yeah. It's all the things that law enforcement can do to show themselves as human. That is the same cup of coffee. It's the same vehicle right. for the interaction. And I think once I saw that program, the simplicity of it, oh my God, you guys used to, you guys used to rail on me about that. <laughs> Who's that one guy from Culver City? <laughs> oh, Dave, was it Dave? Oh yeah, Dave, he's retired now. Yeah, he's yeah, retired yeah. now. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God, just, just ridicule me. Coffee with the cops, stupidest thing ever. I'll never forget the first one. So we got that grant. Right. Like $399,900. I remember that. Someone from Time Magazine wrote an article on it because they're like, where's that $10? <laughs> Someone bought a pizza in the <laughs> DOJ. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, DOJ gives us this money and the first one we do was in this place called Gulf Shores, Alabama calls place the Redneck Riviera. It's insanely <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. And we're staying in this place. We're like 18 floors up, white sand beaches, wrap around deck around the outside of this place. Not bad. And I filmed it and I walked around and I sent that thing right to Dave. I'm like, keep laughing, dude. Look, <laughs> look where I'm at. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Not so stupid now. That's right. Yeah, very that's cool. Right. No, it's a great program. And it's continued and it continues to grow. And I know where I worked, the residents just, they loved it because they got FaceTime with anybody. It could be a, an officer. It could be FaceTime with the chief. You don't always get that. Yeah. And uh, so it's been successful and I know it's going to continue to grow. G great job on your part and your agency, Hawthorne. So that's yeah, awesome. There was a, uh, uh, yeah, and kudos really go out. We got a name drop, Chris Cognac. And, yes. and actually another guy named John Dixon that, oh, I know, yeah, that I know. never really seemed to get as much credit as he should have for this program. But those were the two guys. I was a captain at the time and... The charge was, hey, go out and figure out how to build better relationships and come up with something that, yep. or because it was tough. Hawthorne was a tough place and it's a tough community to crack and you could feel the tension. And uh, and Chris and John, I'll never forget, they're sitting in my office, like, oh yeah, we got this great idea. We're gonna go to McDonald's. We're just gonna serve people coffee. We're gonna call it coffee with a cop. And I was like, in my mind, I'm like, this is the <laughs> stupidest thing I've ever heard of. But I had learned as a leader, you should start with yes, oftentimes. I think yeah. in law enforcement, people start with no. Yeah. So no. And then maybe someone can break through. Yeah. Um, but I used to try to start with yes. And on that one, I started with yes. And I went to the first one. It was a complete disaster. And we learned. And off we went. But those two guys really stuck with it, pioneered the program. And next thing, we were teaching a thing all across the country. And last week, it was uh, presented as a joke on Saturday Night Live. Hey. We oh, made it. really? Oh, I did not <laughs> see that. I have to check that out. You've made big time. That's right. Yeah. No, congrats on that program. Yeah, thank That's you. awesome. And, thank and, you. and John and Chris, congrats to those two oh, guys. They're as well. awesome. Yeah. Okay. So as a police chief, what was your leadership style? You as a chief, you like, I'm over this organization. I'm responsible here. What was your philosophy? Yeah, so I definitely saw it. The challenge for me was, okay, if I take this job, wow, like I've talked a lot of shit over the years, right? We all have. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. this guy doesn't know what he's doing and that guy doesn't know. Okay, yeah, sit your ass in the seat and let's see what can happen. So I was very 
self-aware like yeah. all right boy you've seen awesome leadership you've seen horrific leadership you know what to do maybe what not to do and how are we going to do this so my philosophy going in was it was really like artists with a blank canvas and i kept saying to myself all right there's a blank canvas on that wall like how are you going to direct painting this picture essentially and so i'd always been a big fan of vision mm. and the thing that i would focus on a lot throughout my career was vision and it was the thing I thought that most law enforcement agencies never had. Companies in America, yeah. they have a vision. Right. They have a slogan. They're going somewhere. The employees know that direction. And I think in civil service, we get caught up in, we're just needed. Right. Like the phone's gonna ring and we're gonna go. And we start forgetting, wait a minute, that's a customer that we have to build a relationship with. And then it gets really easy to, to become mediocre. I oh, mean, yeah. civil service yeah. breeds mediocrity, right? Go ahead, do less. The longer you're there, we're going to pay you more. It's the exact <laughs> opposite of the American society. Right. And so I, through vision, started to develop a philosophy of, all right, let's put a vision together. Let's tell people where we are going. And my style was definitely one of, I'd always preached empowerment anonymity, empowerment, creativity. I wanted an, an organization that was able to create and to do those things. It's hard in law enforcement because if you bite someone's head off, oh, yeah. they're never going to produce again. And when you always hear cops, oh yeah, we're not empowered to do our job or this and that. Okay. Guess what happens when you empower them? You have the same amount that are like, wait a minute, can't you just tell me what to do? You're going to tell me, go out and do my job. <laughs> yeah, like you're wearing a badge and a gun. I'm pretty sure you can do that. Uh, <laughs> right. But some people need to be told, no, on this day, go to yeah. this corner and write that ticket because they don't, they're not comfortable with vision and empowerment. Right. So it's, a, it's catch 22, but I definitely think that having vision, empowerment, creativity in an organization makes it better. And so that was my style. Yeah, no, I think that, and we can talk about that in a few minutes, but I think with my group, when I say my group, the guys I worked with, the girls I worked with, people that I had conversation with, they saw, they knew that about you, that you were, you weren't afraid to take a chance. I think a lot of people say, leaders say, we're going to, we think outside the box. Yeah. And then you come up with these ideas in a meeting and uh, we're not going to do that. That's no, we're not, we're not going to do that. But it sounds like you did think outside the box. You allowed other people to think outside the box and you said, let's try it. Let's do it. Yeah. And the other thing is I, yeah, I really didn't do anything. If as a leader, especially as a police chief, if you start making the day-to-day -day decisions of what's going to happen, right. every day-to-day -day decision is going to come to you to make. And now you have a one-person show. And that's that's not how you run an organization. You have to get, get your bandwidth through your people. Yeah. And if you can set them off on a vision and say, this is the direction we're going, figure out your own style of how to get that accomplished, then you have this massive force multiplier. Yeah. But instead of having two people working a coffee with a cop program, you have 100 people with a community-oriented policing philosophy. And that's what I think is important. So I would have people come to you all the time, hey, boss, like, when are we gonna change the design on the cars? Yeah, I don't know. Like, when are we? Do it. Yeah. And I would never let someone leave the office wearing their backpack. Like, they'd bring the backpack in, and right. everybody tries to leave that thing on your desk. That's right. So, no. You know what? Stop talking shit. If you want to do something, do it. Now, there's going to be parameters, of course, but I can help navigate you get around that. And yeah. um, there's a lot of people in organizations that absolutely thrive with that. And those are your 20% and percent. Those are your rock stars. They're going to take that and run. And when people start seeing that success, the agency starts to move. And I'm pretty proud of that. I think we did that. Scares the hell out of a lot of people that don't want to do that. But oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Taking a risk. I'm all in on risk taking. That's good. There are a lot of people who say they will and they just don't. For, what if for, for Some for very obvious reasons. And it's okay. I'm not in their shoes, but I get it. It's funny because where I worked prior we would talk about ideas and whatnot and Redondo would come up and this is the truth. Oh, hear what Redondo's doing, what Redondo's doing. And there was a guy I worked with who said, I, I don't want to hear that. Don't talk about Redondo, but you guys say great. And the, the fact that you had patches, <laughs> how yeah. many patches did you wear in a year? Oh my God. So by the time I, and they're still making them by the way, <laughs> by the time I left, I think we had at least 12. Yeah. Maybe even more now. We would joke. But here was the thing. It was like, we get so caught up in this whole like uniform thing in law enforcement and you want to see a police chief go crazy or 
a an association you talk about changing a uniform or oh, a yeah. patch oh my goodness <laughs> and the bottom line is a what i found was these uniform changes these over vests these different belts uh, wearing a baseball cap wearing a black t-shirt white t-shirt oh my god cops oh, yeah. are probably cracking up right now we can't wear the triangle death all this bullshit <laughs> as a police chief i don't think once ever I had someone from the community come up to me and say, hey, I don't like the way that looks. So when it came to patches, I was like, let's do this pink patch thing. Yeah. It was supporting breast cancer. Let's do it. And that was the first one. And I was ju just there in Redondo. And that's no big deal. Everyone was doing that. And then after that, it became like, hey, can we make a Christmas patch? Yeah, go ahead. Can we? Yeah, go ahead. I didn't design anything. The next thing, we had patches coming out of the woodwork. Oh, yeah. And then it just became a, hey, if you want to wear the patch for that month, wear it. If you don't, if you're in a formal, or you're wearing a tie in a class A, you're not going to wear right. you wear the, the regular patch. But that was the rule. And oh, my God, that thing went crazy. We had patches for everything. Yeah. We made a patch. This was the one that I had the most involvement in because it was the hardest to pull off. Before I retired... So my story moves back into motorcycles. As you yes, know. so that's right. we developed this killer motorcycle with Honda, the Africa Twin, and we basically changed the platform for a police bike. And Honda loves it, of course. So for a retirement gift, these guys pull some strings and they get us to Supercross, and our bikes are displayed with the race bikes, and we're like oh, nice. Team Honda super cool nice hey man like we need a patch for this and we needed it in short order try to use honda's logo on something and see how that goes for you anyway long story short we pulled it off red patch honda oh and wow. we wore those on the uniform and i gave one to the president of honda and he about cried wow. like those things were hot commodity and wow. we made we because to, to do it we had to make a limited number right. obviously couldn't sell them i think we made 100 patches and yeah, those well, things are gone. If you can get one, good luck. I was going to say, I'm going to have to do an eBay search. <laughs> I'll have to pay a pretty penny, I'm Maybe. sure. It's possible. You never know. Talking about the philosophy. So, slogan, motto, whatever it is, for Redondo. I remember seeing it for the first time and having a conversation with people like, oh my gosh, that's spot on. So, for those who don't know, the motto, I'm saying motto or slogan, vision. vision, call it a vision, is, and it's on your, it's everywhere. It's, we are the community leading the way in law enforcement. And that's a bold statement, but I think it's a great statement. And we had a conversation like, that's spot on. So how'd that come about? So it came about when I became the police chief, I gave it, I don't know, three, four months, maybe five. I can't remember the exact time frame, but hey, let me get a feel for the organization. I was left with a beautiful blueprint assessment that was done by the police chief John New prior to me. I knew a lot of what the issues were in the agency and kind of the recommended direction it needed to go. We put together one of these like team building workshop type things and I broke it down to the to the moderator. Like all those things that that post wants you to do, all of those stupid things. And you've probably <laughs> been to many of these. Oh yeah. I'm like, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're gonna do two things. We're going to define leadership. What does leadership mean in this organization? And we're going to create a vision. Mm. And if you can't do those two things, I don't need you. And that's what we did. And we created this vision in this workshop. And my only influence on that was I would not let the agency sell itself short. So I didn't sit down and write the vision. Now, the, the agency needed to change to become more community oriented. That's where the we are the community, not a part of, partner with, relationship, right. all that crap that we normally hear it's no we are yeah if it happens to you it happens to us that was the philosophy and then obviously the leading the way in law enforcement that was the creativity innovation technology let's really let's really try some stuff here and it came about in that room of all of the supervision and association and civilian staff and mm. everybody that was in that room and i would sit back and they would come up with stuff for hours yeah and then you go okay chief we got it here it is and then they would look at my face and I would try not to have a reaction. And then at one point I'd be like, yeah, you're selling yourself way too short. Hmm. Like it needs to be tougher than that. Yeah. And so we wanted something that was attainable, a direction, some place to go, but Hey, let's make it tough. Yeah. I think it's great because I think a lot of times you'll see a model where it says we strive to be, we strive instead of we are. Yeah. Striving. Okay, great. But we are the community. That's yeah. Name me an organization in law enforcement that 
actually in their philosophy tries to be the best. Yeah. You don't have to be, you can just exist and the calls come in and that's where it all goes wrong. We shouldn't be doing that. Our communities deserve much more. Yeah. So let's figure out a way. And in my philosophy, let's figure out a way to make this more like a good high tech company. Mm, Um, What do they do? What do they do with someone that's not performing? That person's gone. Yeah. It's a little, little more difficult for us. Right. But there are ways to incentivize people. And so you have to figure those out. Definitely. And it worked. Seems like it worked for you guys. No, seriously. So you guys were looked to as an apartment where there was great leadership and and a lot of collaboration and just overall a a good department. So it worked. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about something else uh, more specific. And I know it's something that you're very passionate about. It goes back to 2014 when you attended the Post Command College and you wrote an article and it was really an eye opener, but it talked part of it. And I think a, a lot of it talked about TACMED. The, why don't you tell us about that article, what TACMED is and why it's so important? Yeah. In Command College, you have to write this dissertation of sorts and get the thing published or attempt to anyway. And so I wrote this article called The System is Broken. And I wrote it because I was pissed off at what I was seeing in our communities. And this is basically the relationship between police and fire, Mm. the bantering back and forth crap that we all know about, but more about, no, the actual translation into what's happening on the street to our citizens. And what I was seeing was that there was a lot that wasn't being done from my perspective on the medical side, and it was forcing law enforcement to pick up the slack. Mm. Any cop knows this, unless you're in an area that has a killer relationship with your fire department and a great TAC med program, maybe you don't know this, but most cops in my generation knew the feeling of the person, multiple gunshot wounds sitting there or the horrific car accident or whatever the travesty may be, and you're standing there in the community, you do something. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get something done in about five minutes when the fire department shows up because we didn't know what to do. And we didn't have the equipment to or the training. Mm. And there was always this, oh, there's this liability if you try to do something. Right. All that's bullshit. And so TACMED came about through, hey, let's get the let's get the medicine to the hands of the first responders, not necessarily the medicine, but the tools to do something. And so I became passionate about training people on how to do that. And I went to the nth degree to find a bunch of trauma doctors to come and they volunteered at the police department. They became part of our SWAT team. We started on the SWAT team, bringing them into the fold. And, and then we started pushing that out to the everyday cop. So they started carrying TAC med kits and we pushed that as far as we could till we could influence post to start training our cops to have that equipment and do that stuff in the field because I got sick and tired of waiting for firefighters to show up. And now knowing more about it, yeah, it's the system. It's not necessarily their fault, but come on, we can do better than a hundred foot ladder truck going to someone with a broken finger. It's bullshit. Yeah. I think your article goes in a lot of detail about that and the importance of the attack medicine and the importance of training those officers who are on the street who 99.999 if not 100 percent of the time could get to a call because of being on the street before fire and then sometimes feeling maybe hopeless or helpless or not confident or that fear of liability or just maybe not knowing what to do yeah and it's exasper it's exasperated when it's your partner now that now you're Cop cars are turned into ambulance every day in America. Why? Because they don't want to wait. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Throw your partner in the back of the car. Let's go. Throw the baby in the back of the car. Let's go. So, hey, let's give them the tools and train them on what to do so we can save more lives. And that's where that article came from. It was so controversial when I wrote it. I remember the the guy, I can't remember his name. Bob. Bob. (laughs) Oh, Bob. Yeah. He called me and we're talking about the article and He's like, well, where are you going to try to publish this? I'm like, I don't know. Send it to some cop magazine or something. Yeah. He's no, this needs to go to the LA Times. Mm. And I'm like, yeah. I'm not sure not, about Not right now. <laughs> Did it ever go to the Times? No, it never went to the Times. It never got any traction anywhere. But I always had that in the back of my mind. And then once again, I become a fire chief and it's put up or shut up. Let's start really examining this and see if you can, see if you can make any influence to fix it. So from 
before the command college or before you got passionate about this, where did you see the training for police officers? We went to our CPR training, our first area training, post mandates, you go to that. And then to where you're at, to where they're at now. Yeah. What do you see? What are some of the changes? It's huge changes. I think, I think law enforcement's taken a lot of cues from the military. Lots of these units have figured out what is the training that like a Navy corpsman's doing to serve like the Marine Corps on the front lines mm -hmm. and what are those things and can some of those translate into what we do in, in uh, everyday, everyday society here? And the answer is yes. Stopping bleeds and plug in a gunshot hole with a chest seal. These are very, very basic things. You can teach anyone to do it in a matter of an hour. And the training is way different now. Hell, when I was in Redondo, we put 500 backpacks, which were trauma kits, in every classroom mm. in the entire school district. And we trained every teacher how to put on a tourniquet and a chest seal on kids in case the bad man came in and shot them. Try to sell that to a school district. Oh my God, the superintendent to this day, just he just shakes his head, but he's so, he's so grateful that we, we kind of worked through those challenges because the truth is, I would tell a teacher, they go, it's not my job, I didn't sign up for this. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. But if a kid puts his hand through a glass window, are you gonna grab a towel and stop the bleeding or are you just gonna sit there? I'm gonna grab a towel. Let's teach you how to use a tourniquet then. And they're grateful once once they're trained. Yeah, I remember you guys doing that. Did you partner with the Kings on that? We did, LA Kings. Yeah. So how'd that come about? LA Kings through our police foundation. We started a police foundation and there's a guy named Kelly Cheesemans, who's like the COO of the LA Kings. Cool guy, lives in Redonda Beach. And he got on the board right away. And uh, he was like, hey, I'm in this. What can we do, especially for youth, youth programs? And so I'm like, look, you got this idea. And they were all in on it. And we developed these backpacks. We went through a trauma doctor. And that's basically the same exact thing that the cops are carrying. The Got same it. exact thing. And you, you trained all the teachers? Trained all the teachers. Wow. Run, hide, fight. How do you put a tourniquet and a chest seal on a kid? And then, of course, you have CPR and all those other things in there. But, yeah, it's a big deal. So when it comes to training law enforcement, the officers, do you see, are there different levels of training? You have somebody who, maybe a police officer, who has been trained to be a paramedic? or and then can teach the other officers other people maybe there's a different level do you see that happening yeah i totally see it happening so i one of the things from that philosophy that article i wrote the system is broken the reason that came about is because i was sending cops to emt school because i was passionate about hey we need more people on the front line that are better trained emts even up to paramedics and you want to freak a fire department tell them that uh, you're sending all their cops to paramedic school um they call it mission creep oh interesting and I call it stop driving the ladder truck to the call and be out in the field because someone's got to do something. The public doesn't care what your uniform looks like. They just want the help. So yeah, there's different levels of training. I think by the time I left Hawthorne, we had 19 EMTs. Officers. Were, yeah, officers. Wow. And when I went to Redonda, the same thing. Hey, who's interested in doing this? And you'd be surprised. A bunch of cops are like, yeah, I'm in. And it's just because they need to have that skill set on the front line when they're out in the field. So yeah, all the way up through, all the way up through paramedic would be the goal. Now it doesn't have to be that way, but maybe if firefighters were driving around in a Ford Explorer, patrolling mm -hmm. like a cop was and could get there at the same time, you start removing some of these needs. And I just think that the black or blue and red need to work a little bit closely together yeah. and start think, stop thinking about yourself. Start thinking about that person that's lying on the ground and what's really best served here. And we can figure that out. We can also figure it out with the private ambulance companies too. They're pretty fast. Why they don't show up first? Because they don't want to be firemen. You don't show up first. Mm. You're gonna get you're gonna get yelled at and you're gonna get ridiculed. And that article came about because I had a bunch of cops training to be EMTs riding in the back of ambulances wearing a stupid white button up shirt. Not identified as a cop. Not identified as a cop. Yeah. And they were there to get their hours to become EMTs. Holy shit. The way they were treated by the firefighters that were showing up on scene, mm. like second rate citizens. It got so bad. They would come to me and they go, You're not gonna believe this. And they would tell me all the stories that were in that article. Wow. And then was it that article or I read it 
did you encourage or officers have been encouraged to wear something that identified them they, as a police officer? They did it. They self-deployed that way. I'm like, we're not doing this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. They started wearing, I don't know, a polo shirt, yeah. maybe a, a hanging badge or something like that because yeah. yeah, they were just, they were getting, they were getting ridiculed and treated like shit. So it'd be pretty innovative. And I think it's a great call by the way, but just out of curiosity, oh, let me back up. So you mentioned sending a, a ladder truck to a rescue call compared to having somebody in a Ford Explorer or some type of SUV, firefighter, paramedic on patrol. Does, do you know of any departments that do that? Not around here. Yeah. I think on the East Coast, they bifurcate a bit better medical to fire. Got it. The problem on the West Coast is, or the problem as I see it, you keep in mind, there's not a lot of people that are going to agree with me on this. The issue is that you have fire departments and you have people that are trained in a dual role. They're firefighters and they're paramedics. In fact, many of these agencies, you can't get hired unless mm. you're both. Right. Trained firefighter, trained paramedic. And so they come in. What they want to do is they want to fight fires. It's badass. It's like cops. They want to run a gun, chase people and have pursuits. And yep. that's the sexy part of what we do. Yeah. Is that really what cops do? No. no. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> yeah. Firefighters. They do fire-related stuff about one point. Let me give you just the agency or the numbers I can give you from Redondo because that's the one I studied. It's 1.3% of the time. 1.3% of the time they're doing something fire-related. Mm. So what are we doing all the other time? 75 to 80% of that time is spent doing medical calls. But they set everything up around a system of fire. Right. 24-hour shifts, multiple fire stations, staging fire equipment close to where the fire could be, all of these things. But if you look at the numbers, it makes no sense. Right. So to change all of that, you would have to unravel these MOUs that have yeah. minimum staffing. They have these crazy schedules right. and they don't have people that are deployed out on the street. And But you know what I found by doing this research and talking with the firefighters and they understand that. It's not that they would be happy about changing that system, but they right. really do deep down want to do the best for their communities. And with some good leadership, I think we can start to move the needle on it. Yeah, that's very innovative, but change is it's difficult to change. It's very difficult. And that's not just firefighters. That scares the hell out of politicians, too. Yeah, exactly. Like I've, I've had these talks. I'm like, what can we do? And I tell them, well, here's the numbers. Yeah. Oh, we should change it. Yeah. We'll start with the MOU. Oh, geez. It's a battle. Yeah. It's a battle. Boy, yeah. you want to talk about unions and associations that'll fight. Yeah. These guys will fight. Yeah. Good for them. But shoot, man, my son or daughter, you want to be a copper farm? Tell them right now, get in the red line. Yeah. Get in the red line. It's a badass line. Yeah. I want to make sure that I'm saying, though, once getting into it, being a fire chief for 18 months, getting exposed really to what it is they do, I was super impressed. Yeah. Super impressed. What I was most shocked about is you and I, we really don't know what they do. True. If we don't know, the public has no idea. Yeah. But they love them. Oh, my God. 98% approval rate. Oh, yeah. But when you ask the question, what do they do? They don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But they do a lot. Yeah. A lot that goes that people just don't know about. That's right. Yeah. And it's a great profession. Obviously, we know. Incredible. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Incredible. And I just think it can be so much more. I think law enforcement has had this horrible turn in the barrel a couple of times where we're just like getting beat up. Yes. And I keep looking going, how come this isn't happening to the firefighters? Right. It's happening. Mm. It's different though. It's not happening. Like the pressure's not coming from the communities. You know where it's coming from? It's coming from the people that hold the purse strings. They're like, wait a minute. How's this dude making four hundred fifty thousand oh, right. dollars a year? Yeah, what's up with all this overtime? Now, wait, are we really paying people to sleep throughout the night? One point three percent. All this stuff is coming up, but it's coming up from the leg of the stool that I would call the the leaders in the community, the political structure. Yeah. They're asking the questions, and I'm telling the firefighters, be careful. Why? They hold the purse strings. Yeah you might have a tougher run than we had in law enforcement when the community's pissed off at us. Yeah. If the politicians pissed off, you might be in big trouble. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So let me back up just a little bit in regard to having the officers trained, the EMTs, just advanced training for officers to save lives. Can you give one or two examples of how this training paid off in a way where a street cop was responded to some rescue call and because he or she responded and they were trained, 
didn't have to wait for the firefighters, paramedics to get there, the officer saved a life or a couple examples? Oh yeah. So most of it that I've seen happens with tourniquets, but I've mm. also seen it happen with chest seals. I've actually done chest seal myself on like a 10 year old kid. Oh wow. Uh, wasn't that tough. Don't know that saved the kid's life or not. Right. I know that the kid lived, but we see it all the time. A lot of times it's it's the car accident and someone has some horrific bleed. And I've seen officers put tourniquets on people's legs. There was a kid in Hawthorne when we first started this training. He did one of those nasal airways mm. at the scene of a traffic accident on someone that was like basically choking on their own blood. Mm. And he stuck this nasal airway in and opened up the airway until the paramedics got there. And they always would show up and be like, who did this? Oh, wow. And yeah, we've had, there was a, an officer in Redondo where the trauma doctor called from Harbor and was like, Hey, that cop that put the tourniquet on this guy, like saved their life. Oh, so wow. it happens a lot more than we would know. And it's happened. And a lot of it's not just the equipment and the training, but it's the confidence that's being built. Yes. And it's, Hey, we got to do something and, and cops will do it. It's a perishable skill. You have to keep be, maintain your whatever your certificate is yeah. or whatever yeah so it's not just let's do it one time and forget about it that's important for sure they keep doing that it's good let me ask you so with all that said and this vision and besides the let me back up with this vision do you see people any i can assume one but are there any obstacles we don't want the cops being trained to do this or why are we training the cops to do this? Why are we paying this money for them? Has there been any obstacles? And if there has been, has anybody's mind been changed? Oh God. So it's been nothing but an obstacle. Mm. I think that the obstacles are starting to dissipate a bit, but the struggle was real, man. <laughs> yeah. I, a lot of it had to do with this, oh, the liability, the liability. What if, the what if, yeah. what if a cop does this and then we get sued? What if that, and you know what the best answer to that is that I've come up with over the years? What if they do nothing? What's the liability in doing nothing? It's huge. This person could die. We're damaging relationships with the community. Have you ever, I don't know if you have, I have, definitely. I've been standing there and I've had people, they want to kill me. They're screaming at me do something. Oh yeah. Yes. And I'm like, I don't really know what to do with this here. So yeah, the, the obstacles were tremendous. It, it is expensive, but you know what? Everything's an obstacle in change. Oh, yes. Yeah. The way I had it described to me, this was actually by one of the, one of the guys that runs, he's the, what do you call it? Like the medical director for the County. Okay. It's big. So, Big position. Big position, yeah. At one point in time, I'm like, look, here's the kit. Here's everything we want to carry. Here's like the training we need and all this kind of stuff. And here's the problems we're having. And I remember him telling me, it's like pushing against a concrete wall. You've got to continually apply mm. just a little bit of pressure and eventually it's going to break. And I think it's broken for law enforcement. I think there's no problem now tra training cops on this stuff and, and getting them the equipment they need. But, oh, nothing but obstacles. Hell, I'd been, I wrote a bunch of grants. I was trying to get all these different things, and I would get medical directors from the county that sit on, like, Homeland Security stuff telling me, like, you can't do that. You can't, there's no way a law enforcement agency can have an ambulance and this and that. And I would look them right in the face, and I would go, you realize we have a bunch of ambulances. They're just black and white. We use them every day. Great point. And great point. Yeah. So huge struggles, but I always saw it as a challenge. Every time we'd get kicked in the nuts with something, yeah. we'd leave a meeting and I'd go, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go. That's and let's just keep, because I know it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Because you know who cares? The person on the ground and their family. That's who cares. Yeah. They're going to back me up on this. Yeah. Eventually. I hope. It's easy when there's a challenge in anything to say, I don't have enough time. I don't know if the effort is worth it yeah. when you know it is, but it's more work. And if you're sometimes like the doctor said that you just got to keep applying that pressure. Yeah. And sometimes ever so slow, slightly it'll happen. Yeah. But it's going to take time. Yeah. And some of this stuff's so easy. There's no reason we can't have an AED in every police car. Come on, guys, this is basic. But if we queried across the country oh, right now, yeah. most cops are listening to this. They don't have an AED in their police car they probably don't have that trauma kit on them but you know what i take that back they probably do but it's their own good great right? point yeah what do they call it go bag the go bag they've got it in there and you know whether their agency lets them do it or not you know what and good on them 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because if they get shot or their partner gets shot, put the damn tourniquet on. That's right. No, it's good, a good point. And remember back in the day, you may have an AED, you may have three. They're in the supervisor vehicle. <laughs> yeah. <Well>, Bat- <laughs> batteries are dead. Yeah, batteries are yeah. dead. And sometimes, good luck getting hold of that supervisor. It's just like- TAC Med. Yeah, we've got TAC Med. Where are they? They're on the SWAT team. Yeah. Yeah, great. <laughs> it's like with the firefighters. Like 1.3% of the time, we're going to do something with SWAT. Yeah. 90% of the time, we're going to do something with the patrol officer. That's why are we training the SWAT guy in TAC Med yeah. only? Why not this person? Hell, why not the, the civilian working parking enforcement? They're going to show up on scene too. True. And we have to remove all these layers of ego and just say, hey, I don't know. Let the teacher do it. And it can't be. We can't teach teachers. That's right. our job. Yeah. So do you have any recommendations or suggestions to police chiefs, sheriffs, city council, city managers on, on getting them to understand the importance of funding? Because that's a change for them too. Why are we paying these guys now this much money? Or why do they want this in the budget for training? We've never done that before. Do you have any suggestions or suggestions on how to change their minds or have them be more open to including that in the budget. Yeah. Best thing that, that I can do is you got to show proof. You've got to make a lot of things. What we do, our city managers, our politicians, they don't really know or understand. You've got to show them. So whether that means putting them in a police car and dragging them around, bringing them out to training, giving them the firsthand experience of what it is, that always works the best. Yeah. Now, to do that, you normally have to have a pretty good relationship with your city managers, with your politicians, and the chiefs that write that stuff off. I hear it all the time. Yeah, but I'm not a politician. I don't do that shit. So right. then you're an idiot. Right. <laughs> because you're right. losing... The most important thing, funding yeah. that your officers need so that they can serve their community. It's it's a three-leg stool as a police chief, or maybe even four, I call mm. it now, four, four-leg stool. Yeah. You have your department itself, you have your community, you have your political leadership, and then you have your personal life and your family. And you've got to spend time on all of those things. And if you lose one, you'll balance on that mm-hmm. chair. Good, Good balance. Yeah. You can knock out a leg. Yeah. You'll be fine. Yeah. Knock out two. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, you're going to get fired. Yeah. What I'm saying is you've got to have a great relationship with the people that hold the purse strings. They have to understand. And a lot of things we can show them now, we can show them through digital media and mm-hmm. video. Hell, you asked me about, hey, have you seen a specific circumstance? Yeah, I've seen a lot. I've seen some really bad shit. I've seen cops intubated in the field. I've seen horrible stuff. How do we explain that to people? You go to, uh, I think on Hawthorne's, City of Hawthorne, I think it's cityofhawthorne.com or hawthornepolicedepartment.com. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> I can't remember anymore. This my, Mike's my old partner there. Yep. They have a feed of their cops' body cameras just doing TAC Med stuff. Oh. It's insane. Interesting. Just TAC Med. You watch a couple of those. And so that's what the politicians need to see. And look, if you're explaining shit correctly as a police chief, to the purse string holders, you'll get what you want. You know why? Because they need the votes from the community. And if you're able to have this relationship with the community, you know what your community needs. It's supposed to be a team. We're all supposed to be working together towards the greater good of right. our communities. That's right. And a lot of times the police chief has to be the one that is the, the moderator. Yes. That's right. I'm going to moderate between the community and politicians and the city manager. Like I'm the, the person because the hell they're fighting over this political issue and this and that and development this. And yeah. So, whoa, hold on a minute. Don't forget car accident, person on the street. That's right. Like, li- safety and security that comes first. True. And you brought up a good point. So what we'll do is I'll look, I'll research that link and we'll put it in the show notes because I think people want to see that. And the more they see it, they become educated. They understand the importance of that. But let me ask you this question. We're talking about funding. Hopefully we have a wide audience here with police officer level, supervisor, manager, whoever, the public. But for those, say the officers, there's no funding or in their budget for this type of training and this type of equipment and they want it, but there's not in the budget. Do you have some alternatives that they can go? These officers watching this go to their team and say, Hey, we should tap into this. Yeah. You can get a lot of this training for free if you want it. I remember we had a funding problem at one point in Hawthorne and I wanted crazy tech med training. I went to the, I went to the Marine base and said, Hey, 
look, I got this program. Anything you can help us with? Yeah. Guys, hold on a minute. Let me introduce you to this Navy Corpsman. Yeah, here we'll just slip you guys into this course. There's ways nice. there's ways to there's ways to do it. The cost of the equipment's pretty cheap. We didn't pay for any of the training in Hawthorne. We mm. had volunteer trauma doctors come in and they were happy to do it. The other avenue is you have residents that are becoming doctors that work at hospitals and stuff like that. A lot of times for their res residency, they'll have these community projects they need oh, to do. Hey, come in, can you train our guys how to do this? And it doesn't need to be a doctor. Hell, a nurse can tell you how to do it. Or right. can our fire department start training? Our this used to drive me insane. Why aren't they training us? Better yet, if you've got your own fire department, why aren't they completely integrated in everything that the police department does? They should be on your SWAT team. They should be running your TAC med programs. They should be the ones that are certifying people as EMTs. That stuff shouldn't cost that much money. So I think there are ways to get around it. Yeah, that's good advice because I think a lot of times people need to know those alternatives. So when they hit a wall, hit that obstacle, they can go, oh, let's call the Marines. Yeah. Or let's, and you've named a few things, but I'm sure there's others that other people can go, oh, let's go into this person. Great advice in regard to that. We're going to wrap up here in a minute, but do you have anything else you'd like to add or something you think is important to, to comment about in regard to TAC Med or that relationship with police, fire, funding, whatever you think is important in regard to this? I think the most important thing is that public safety as a whole needs to sit at the table better together hmm. to provide a better product to the community. Had this very fortunate and unique um, position to be in where I was both a police chief and a fire chief. And not a lot of police chiefs get to do that. And it's been a huge eye opener. But when you start peeling back the layers of the onion, and, okay, here's like the men and women that we have that work in both of these entities. And if you put them in a room together and remove all the politics and the egos and stuff, yeah. they'll come up with the best stuff that we've ever heard. But someone's got to provide the table that, that they can sit at. And I would just say, we can do better. Yeah, We can do better. We can do way better. There are many things that we could be integrating a fire department into a police department for and vice versa. Take this whole issue of homelessness. As a department, we went all in social workers, navigators, psychologists, drug addiction counselors, social workers riding with cops and cars, oh, yeah. uh, pallet yeah. shelters, geez, you name it, we went all in. I move over to the fire department and I'm like, where are you at on this? What do you mean? Shit, 90% of this stuff is medical. What are the cops even, why are we doing this? We're doing it because you're not doing it. You should be in on this. How come there's not a social worker riding in an ambulance? Let's Let's work on this a bit more together. So when I think when I got to see both sides, the thing I saw was we have this massive duplication of effort and we're spending tons of money in these cities we don't need to be. Probably, yeah. You take administrative investigations in a police department. You have this unit and they do all this kind of shit. Fire department, yeah, good luck. These, those dudes don't do any of that stuff. Right. But it's a needed entity. So should we pay to train? Should we do all this? Or should we just maybe integrate those two things? It used to drive me crazy in a police department that we didn't have a CPA. I'm running a $48 million budget. I don't have a CPA. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so we create one, figure out how to do it. And maybe that person could be served also doing the fire department. Mm. I'm spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on the maintenance of grants and equipment and all this kind of stuff. How come the grant writer's not doing both? Like the, these things are no brainers. And I think that our, our chiefs and our leadership and police and fire should be putting their heads together. And if not, then their boss, the city managers and the mayors should be forcing those heads together yeah. to stop duplicating efforts and provide a better product to our people out on the street. Yeah. Great advice. That communication, collaboration, learning what each other does or you guys do, you have a better understanding and to work together because yeah. you want the same thing. Hopefully you want the same thing to serve the community and to represent your agency, your staff. So yeah, that's good advice. Yeah. So before we wrap up, you may not remember this, but I, I want to say, because to me, to this day, I can still remember. Gosh, it's probably around 2011, 2012, something like that. I forget. I was promoting or looking to promote to captain. And I was reaching out to some people, whatnot, and they were very nice, sat down with me, great advice. 
And I remember, you may not remember this, you probably don't remember this, but I reached out to you and to your, uh, you talked about Mike Ishii, yeah. current chief, soon to retire from Hawthorne PD, and say, hey, can I meet with you guys or whatever? And uh, you invited me over and we went in your office and I thought it was just gonna be me and you. Nothing against Mike, but I just went in your office. The next thing I know, Mike comes in, the door shut, and you guys spent like two, two and a half hours with me. And we're very, you didn't hold back. You asked, why do you wanna do this? What are you doing now? What's your background? And then you started peppering me, which I was not prepared for, by the way, with oral board questions. And I'm like, shit. I don't. But with that said, you two really did take the time. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm sure you both did it together as individuals for many people. But I've always appreciated that, where you took the time to sit down with me together for two, two and a half hours and really expressed a, you were genuine in wanting to help. And I remember this, and you, again, and I forget <laughs> what it was, but you said something like, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but you said, from what I recall, do you think I wanna go to that meeting or this meeting or that meeting? I don't wanna go to those meetings, but I represent the Hawthorne Police Department. That's why I go to these meetings. And I, that always stuck with me, and that's going back 10 some years. And there were a lot of meetings, I'm like, shit, I really don't wanna go to this meeting. I don't want to go here, but you go, this is my position. I represent this agency. I'm one of several who represents this agency and I need to go. And you go and you, when you're there, you're like, oh, I'm glad I went, but I'll never forget you, you expressing that. And so thank you to you. And hopefully Mike was watching this. We're going to force him to watch it. We'll make him watch We're it. We're going to make him watch it. But thank you to you. Thank you to Afishi. And hopefully he has a, a great retirement, but 28 years in law enforcement, coupled with some time with the fire department, just public safety, everything that you did during that time, I wanna say thank you. You were an inspiration as a police chief, as a captain, as a partner, and thank you for your service to the community. And uh, we appreciate you spending time here today on the Behind the Line podcast. Awesome, thank you so much for having me. I've been blessed in this career, and blessed to be given these opportunities and stuff. I hope I made the best of it, but you know what? I sleep well at night and get to do all the things I love now. I hope that uh, the men and women that are watching this carry on, carry yeah. on the tradition. Yeah. It's like I told the fire department when I left, because I live in Redondo, I'm like, I'm watching. <laughs> 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 we need you. Yeah, I'm watching. We, yeah. You know? No, ex said. So anyways, congratulations on a great career and enjoy your retirement. And thanks for spending time today. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like the show, please follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the show notes from each episode, visit BehindTheLinePod.com. If you want to support the show and hear more from our first responders and military veterans, head over to Patreon.com slash BehindTheLine. I'll see you on the next one.